for the sake of time, I'll start early. I had so many slides put in one package because Brar insisted I give her the whole <laughs> set. No, 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 no. Uh, so I'm not going to present everything anymore because Dr. Grusner has spoken, you know, the essential points I wanted to make. I just want, and, and Dr. Grusner asked me to just talk uh, sort of non, just critical issues. So one of the things that Dr. Grusner actually just mentioned was uh, Medicare has been looking at discard rate of kidneys, and and actually I was at I'm one of the committee members at ASRD Network too. And what they have been saying is that centers that are going to accept more organs and reduce the discard rate will be preferentially be favored and encouraged. They will support those centers, despite the SRTSD, SRTR data showing that the outcomes could be bad. So there are two different arms. I look at it, SRTR telling us outcomes might be bad, but Medicare is really pushing for, for centers to take uh, poor kidneys and organs. Let me, I'm going to make a quick yes. comment about that. There is, there is a, the problem with regulatory organization pushing for centers or other things to take things is that you get unintended consequences from it. And the unintended consequences, like for instance, the whole DCD thing, that they wanted that the 15% of the organs transfer should be DCD. What's happened is that standard donors, if you just wait another 12 hours, will become standard donors are pushed towards DCD just to meet the criteria so they can pass the test and not get flagged by CMS. Unfortunately, though somebody has the idea that we should be doing more of these, it has to be developed in time and proved because each center in each area has a different process in how they do things. And it's like, it's the same thing I said, when it comes like Home Depot, if everyone does the same thing, then everyone fails at the same time. So you don't have, you know, developing systems that have, that can function within an environment. So eventually, it just doesn't work all the time. I, I guess what they're trying to say is that as you do more high-risk organs, you you learn and you develop policies going forward. We've done high-risk organs right. for many years. And, we, I, we, we, and that's what, I, what I'm trying to say to you is that policymakers are not practitioners. And these policy makers and practitioners is why such as the local organ donor network will never meet the standards because mm -hmm. they don't have the same environment as say Iowa. You know, it's a different population. And that's one of the problems that we run into. Anyway, got it. No, so no, that's good. I just wanted this sort of a discussion. The first the other the other points that I've taken today is that um, I show this slide because it's always the past is as important as the future, and these people have established uh, the past. And congratulations, you're not the past, you're still the, you're still the future. I'm saying we're moving to other organs, and so other leaders have come in here. And I don't know, most of you all know the gentleman in the right lower org, Dr. Grusna knows him, Dr. Odorico, and that's where I went for under whose uh, uh, eyes, I, you know, I learned about enteric and astomosis. Uh, Dr. Grusner mentioned my past a little bit, but for those who don't know, I, my, my past has been at Mount Sinai for about 12 years, and that's where bladder and astomosis was being initiated, and then I spent in Texas, and of course I saw horrific side effects. I was turned away from it a bit um, until enteric came out, and I saw the miracles of enteric and astomosis. Again, it's not never that easy, but of course outcomes are much better. Um, I, I wanted to make one or two more points before I, I, I say these things. There's a, a comment that was made about first impressions for Dr. Grusner, about the patients coming to clinic and how they feel. Um, so it, it actually did does matter, I think, very often. Uh, that, uh, But recently I had a two patients who actually got worked up at SUNY Downstate, and then they decided to go to Columbia to get listed there too. And lo and behold, I got the call back from them, quite the reverse, that they, they said, this is horrible at Columbia, but in fact, they enjoyed the experience at SUNY Downstate, and they said, we've never had such a team of coordinators and all calling them and following them and giving them updates. So uh, that's a wonderful thing. So. We are making uh, headways in that. Um, so what did I see at UW and Madison was that everybody works together as a cohesive team. 
So if somebody doesn't have a CAT scan done, some other coordinator picks up and says, OK, I'll order it on her behalf, and I'll take uh, so that the patient, they always are patient-centered, so that the patient gets all this workup done in the shortest possible time. Um, and then I thought something that me and Dr. Grusin have been working on is educational materials and advertising, uh, is that patients need to know everything before they just appear. Like uh, uh, she, uh, she just mentioned uh, that you can be first in the line, but if patients need to be educated, uh, and we have just made the whole book, I believe. Uh, we, we've already made the, the we, entire we pack. Are working on it. Okay, <laughs> so I, I think that'll help a lot if patients are preempted and they're educated well. So again, I'm not going to go through history, but type one diabetes is the main reason we do <coughs> pancreas transplants, and. Uh, all of you all have these slides, so again, I'm not going to waste too much time. But where do we do just pancreas alone? And no kidneys when the GFR is usually around 80 ml per minute. Here at SUNY, we've established it around 70 ml as a cutoff. Um, they have to have good cardiovascular health. They have to be willing to undergo major abdominal surgery. Now, if they're unable to, then they can move towards the islet transplant arm. Um, now, what if they have CKD on top of type 1 diabetes? So as a nephrologist, Brar and I and Tedla see this all the time. But in CKD clinic, I see this quite a bit. And it becomes very critical when to refer the patients. And the cutoff point is the GFR definition. So I don't, maybe, maybe tra kidney transplant people can comment is how you all measure GFR to decide is it really 40 and how many times you need to do. So 24-hour um, urines are done or not done, or do you do all yeah. scan? Not 24-hour urines. Urines are done for donors, but not for recipients. The like recipient is more estimated to be a MDRD. Right, but in, in this case, we'll have to do it for the recipients also to see that the GFR. For recipients, it's uh, estimated mm -hmm. GFR. Right, and I think at Madison, they do 24-hour urines uh, to, to define the exact GFR. Um, and, uh, and if they're already on dialysis, uh, it depends on how long the wait time is going to be there for living donor. Now, this is, I, I guess, Dr. Grusin, you already mentioned this, pancreas after kidney is going to be our first pool to attack, right, to, to get the, these patients in. And we had a patient recently we saw that was a, a nurse She's a type 1 diabetic, and her GFR is 20 ml, but she has a living donor available, her brother, who's a nephrologist, uh, and he's willing to donate. So what should you do? Should you wait? And this was a discussion, actually, in, uh, in the Transplant Cong uh, Congress meeting that should the, this nurse take the kidney from the brother? Should she wait for simultaneous pancreas kidney? Or should she, you know, so what do you do? Um, to make a long story short, so you do want to get the living donor kidney from the brother that frees up the kidney that could go to someone else, and then she can get a pancreas after kidney. Um, as has already been mentioned, survival is very good. And I'm, not, I'm going to skip these slides because these are Dr. Gruse, uh, Angelica Grusner's slides. And doc, Dr. Grusin, you can comment if you have to or uh, want to in these situations. Uh, you're more than welcome to. But I believe the number of pancreas transplants, about 32,000 have been done so far. And, and uh, in which type of diabetes, it's mainly type 1 diabetes, even though uh, it was shown before that you know, it doesn't matter type 1 or type 2, but the bulk of the transplants are being done in type 1 diabetes. Um, and uh, whether you look at, you know, uh, if, if you look at who are the ones in type 1 diabetes and or main, or is mainly Caucasian, but the type 2 diabetics, now you have more African-American representation appearing. And, and over, transplants per million U.S. population, which, which places are doing, D.C. and Wisconsin actually are doing, doing Quite a lot of transplants, uh, and uh, DC 
Tennessee you can't define it as such because they it happened on Maryland, Virginia, and everybody. All of them are lumped so together. So it's, it's a false number. Okay. But Wisconsin is up there too, so and Minnesota. Okay. It's This is just for uh, us to recognize that maybe close to about 140 transplant centers, and you know the number of centers doesn't correlate with number of transplants. Um, again, uh, pancreas transplant centers usually tend to do simultaneous pancreas kidney because the outcomes have been good, um, and they sort of shy away from pancreas transplant alone. Um, maybe the number. Uh, there, there could be other interpretations, but I'm going to sk skip that for now. Um, as evident again, most of the transplants are simultaneous pancreas kidney. And I think there are several reasons for it. Uh, survival is better, but also your wait time on the list for simultaneous pancreas kidney is very short. So the lady that I just presented um, that doesn't want to take a kidney from a brother, or brother doesn't want to donate, might want to just wait because the wait time is so much shorter. Um, also, the organs that come in for simultaneous pancreas kidney are usually a little more healthier organs. They're from younger, younger donors. So um, most of the patients that I saw even in Wisconsin or in Texas, you know, they used to say, let's wait. Uh, so how many number of transplants, and Dr. Grusner has mentioned this to me, so I, until I looked at the slide, it didn't, it didn't settle with me. Usually a center does about 10 transplants of pancreas per year. Um, although there are numbers that have done so many more, on an average, it's about 10 per year. Um, and uh, again, can you, you know, the difference between primary transplant versus retransplant. Retransplants, as Dr. Grusin has already mentioned, is far more difficult, but it can be done. Uh, so most of the centers are doing our primary transplants, and that to SPK is much, you know, much more. Um, Recipient age, this is a questioner I asked uh, his wife, Dr. Angelica Grusner, what is the average age? And I'm sort of looking into this, how old can you push the button to get the transplant? But across the nation, it's a bit, uh, average age of a recipient is around 40 years of age. Um, Children, um, there are a number of children that have un undergone pancreas transplant, particularly the very young. 
and one, but in less than ten, they reject like flies. Between ten and eighteen, it can be done, but better, I mean, closer to fifteen or so. Um, but I mean, that's a very interesting trend that, that we have seen that the older the patient, the um, less likely a graphloform rejection is. And that's one of the reasons why there were a couple of papers at uh, this year's um, annual meeting in Seattle um, where uh, uh, patient seers were presented, uh, patients receiving a pancreas and kidney transplant um, at the age of 60 or above um, with, 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 with good outcome. So it is different than what you would expect. Um, the elderly, I mean, do better uh, for neurological reasons than the young patients. That is why the younger ones because their immune system is strong. There was one scientist, Fadi, you might know him, a basic scientist. I attended some of the sessions, felt it the other way around. They said the older you are, your memory cells are now yeah. getting memory of more antigens, so you might reject. But, but it might be selective. Sele as to, I mean, what of these uh, antigens uh, the body um, uh, perceives as really bad. You know, I mean, there is no doubt that the immune system is very smart. Because if it were not smart, we would have already achieved tolerance. So, uh, I mean, or we are we also perished as a species. Huh? Or we have perished as a species. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. so, this is another slide I asked Dr. Grusner to lend me, and uh, she did. And Because I wanted to see how long diabetics have been diabetic, and this shows that on an average about 25 years before they really come to transplantation or, or get the transplant. Uh, so that means quite long standing. And, and, and this is of a concern, I think, because DCCT trials showed that if you do intensive insulin and you can prevent secondary complications, it's, it's, it's good. Uh, but if you wait 25 years to your diabetics, I think you're okay. going to. This is, this is a factor of whether you have kidney failure or not. Right. Since most of simultaneous you know, kidney pancreas transplants or pancreas after kidneys. Oftentimes, people are unwilling to take the risk of suppressing unless you're, uh, you're, you're getting a kidney for, mm -hmm. for uh, transplant. But, but even pancreas transplant alone, which was surprising to me, is happening after 25 years of diabetes, but not early. I think that relates to endocrinologists not referring. Well, most, most PDA patients are self-referral. And um, as I said last time, the interesting thing is, is that, that women much more educated in that regard doing something prophylactically. So the number of women that undergo a pancreas transplant is significantly higher than that of men. Men uh, undergo more SPKs, but women undergo more PKs. So here's the gender slide, but I think for interest of time, I'll skip this for now. Um, African-American recipients actually with SPK have been rising. So that is good. And actually, I just, while, while the discussion was happening, I said, let me figure out how many African-Americans are in Brooklyn. Does anybody know? 850,000, close, yes. Um, and about 25% of New York City population is African-American. So we have enough of a cohort if there is a disease and diabetes to, to get them to come here. Because the greater diversity within the HLA type is one thought, but no one fully understands it quite well. So this is a slide for Dr. Norin. Um, most of the deceased donor pancreas transplants, you know, have been done with high CPRA. And, and the other thing is, dis despite the mismatching, usually the outcomes of SPK or PTAP have been very good. I think it's because a comment was made that the immunosuppression now is so good and the induction regimens. Um, so uh, I used to think we sh shouldn't even touch the DSA once and I don't touch the bad HLA, but obviously contrary to that. Carrie asked me to put in some more things. I'm gonna skip uh, who have heard me give this lecture before. I only wanted to mention that even though we worry about the HLA DRDQ and the same regions have been identified to cause type 1 diabetes. So in pancreas transplant alone, we've always worried that they might reject because they've had autoantibodies to insulin and all of this. And so part of the testing that we want to Im implement here is to send autoantibodies to insulin and GAD and all of that. And I think I'm, I made the list already. And that's just to follow if someone is rejecting, is it that that titer of that antibody is rising? 
irrespective of rejection from, uh, from the uh, donor antigens. I'm going to skip this whole thing, DCCT trial. But the bottom line of DCCT trial was that you can slow the, the secondary end organ disease, but you cannot uh, completely prevent it. So this is just for people to have it. OK, hypoglycemia was mentioned. I just want to make a point here. There's about 62 per 100 patient years on intensive insulin regimen that get hypoglycemia. So if you can see here, what again was mentioned by Dr. Grusner, more than two third that go on intensive insulin are getting hypoglycemic episodes. Um, so they would be candidates. Um, there are nurses here who take care of di diabetes. And I think hypoglycemia identification is very, very important when you screen your patients. So I, this Clark survey, which was actually shown at the ATC this year, but Madison has been using it. And it basically tells us a risk score. Um, and this survey should be done on all diabetics that come to our clinics uh, that are being screened for kidney pancreas. Because if, if it is identified by the coordinator, and I guess Susan is being identified as one of the main coordinators, I'm, I have a feeling, but could be anybody. No, the, uh, the three coordinators will rotate. I think it's just that Susan works with Parkside, so you're just more used to her. But, okay. but everybody will be involved. All right, so this will push somebody to be ahead of the list somewhat, that they're, they're, they're getting so many hypoglycemic episodes that they should get the transplant faster. Um, Again, I'm, you know, hypogly I spent personally, because again, I sort of learned during my rotations there, that a lot of time is spent on history taking of their hypoglycemic episodes. I mean, how is it being manifested? Because uh, hypoglycemic unawareness is actually more dangerous than hypoglycemic awareness. And, and so I remember Dr. Rico spending <laughs> an hour discussing um, was there somebody with you? Is he severe? What, did somebody give you insulin? <laughs> did you call 911? Were you dry? I mean, all of these details he takes in history taking. So that gives a sense there's an urgency to get the transplant. All right. That's all I had to say. And also, one of the, in, um, amongst the medical nephrologists who take history is this type of insulins, because some of the hypoglycemia could be unrelated to pancreas problem. You know, it could be that the insulin regimens are, are all wrong. So part of, at least I now have to refresh myself always, these, these regimens are changing. So sometimes adjusting the insulin regimen might avoid the hypoglycemia. So they could wait a little bit longer. Anyway, so these are the anti, anti, autoantibodies that we have included in the list of testing. Um, and people can look up their mechanisms and how they were identified. I'm not going to go over this either. Um, so no, this was already mentioned. By getting a pancreas, you get normal glycemia, and it can prevent secondary complications. So again, now these are some of the pictures I had taken when I was there. Um, and what the surgeon is showing is the pancreas going in I'm not going to go over the solutions, but I'll have more pictures to show you later. Um, so for someone to get a pancreas alone candidates, uh, they have to have diabetes and satisfactory renal function. So here's where we changed our, our cutoff not being 80 to 70 um, GFR of getting a pancreas transplant alone. And maybe we can look at the outcomes later on of what happens. Why did you change it? Uh, Dr. Grusner's experience. Yeah, originally, I always said 60. Wisconsin had 80. Mm -hmm. And I thought we would play conservative and meet in the middle. OK. So we can monitor it. Between 70 and 80, if we, we nephrologists know, it can bounce back to 80 with a little better heart failure. Uh, you know, we don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, now, this is our biggest cohort, I think, pancreas after kidney. You know, that's, I, I sort of tried to think a little bit more about this and some things that uh, we need to keep in mind. Um, that pancreas allograft survival after living kidney survival is 64%. These are just numbers. While as in simultaneous kidney, pancreas is 80%. So certainly, simultaneous is better. Weightless mortality after PAC is 18%. 
uh, graph loss is about 14% and so on and so forth. So it's, it's not the best pancreas after kidney, but it's still a good option. Uh, you already saw this. So what determines to choose SPK versus pancreas after living kidney? The, the lady who came to me actually recently, Dr. Grusman, I saw her, is only two things that determine how long is she going to wait on the wait list being a, if, she, if she were to go on dialysis and available donor, this would make the decision whether she should take the kidney from her brother or not. And of course, a blood group. So I am not very familiar with this, how blood groups determine wait time, but maybe so you. Unfortunately, those wait times, um, they, they might be national. Or our, our wait time here in New York, the B blood group is about eight to 10 years. The O is probably about five to seven. Uh, a, B is one to three, and A is somewhere in the three to five range, give or take. Does that sound about yeah. right? Yeah. So something that I'm getting a little bit more familiar with is, you know, that I have to now ask that, <laughs> look at the blood group and say, okay, probably she should get her kidney from a brother first. Um, uh, this may not matter. Mm -hmm. Go back. Go back. And the number of people, the blood groups, Dr. Mm -hmm. Grish, you remind me, very few people who receive pancreas transplant be blood group. And it's seriously AIDS and all these such a AIDS and all. I'm I'm going to skip this for now because of, of again time. Contraindications was already mentioned. We have the same contraindications that Tedler mentioned, so nothing new. But one of the things that we do want to rule out is uncorrectable coronary artery disease. So our patients, because they're diabetics, the average 25 years, even though they have normal, they are going to go for cath, despite the echoes and all. So we are making a policy, everybody gets a cath. Uh, the other thing is, uh, we are requesting all patients to get a CTA, not just a CT abdomen pelvis, to look at the vessels and the iliac vessels. Um, and and uh, we'll, we'll see, I, you know, there was a case mentioned, it happens to be from Parkside that had this groin abscess and gram negative. I'm wondering whether we, if we would have done a CT or CT, we would have picked it up. And I know that I know this patient and on physical, he had no findings whatsoever. <laughs> so, um, Anyway, HIV and you know these were already mentioned could could eliminate them if they have 50 copies and all of this. So now we made some recommendations of considerations age above 55. We have increased here. We are going to try to do transplants up to age of 70. Is that possible, right? Yeah. So, and so chronological age is not as important as how healthy they are, you know. So you could be a runner and still be, I, mean, I saw a lady the other day, she was 93, I could not believe it, she looked like 60, so, but she does she's everything in her house. No, 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 she's not. I'm just, I'm just saying, it's, it's how healthy you, you are, your, uh, the C-peptide, the last one, is a part of a workup to say that there's pancreas failure. If C-peptide is very low, that there's nothing left of the pancreas, they would benefit. But in obese type two, it, it's a little tricky to see if the, is it above two, then the BMI has to be below 30. You can't have both. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, actually, that UNOS you know, policy was redone, was redone? Um, at the last meeting, at the June board meeting. They did away with the C-peptide and the BMI um, requirements or restrictions for, for KP, SPK. 
So the only thing they have to have is they have to be on insulin. That's the only medical criteria other than diabetes and insulin kidney well, diet. Well, the reason why all these, these unnecessary policies were written was that because I let people fall down. You know, I, I let Yeah. Uh, there has always been uh, this rivalry between islet and pancreas transplantation rather than looking at it as, uh, com uh, uh, as complementary uh, and not competing. Um, procedures is an issue because I think you or Carrie may have said before we do either transplants in patients <coughs> that have lots of comorbidities because it's not major surgery. We do pancreas transplants so the results are better, but it's major surgery. So uh, the other people, because they do not in most cases achieve insulin independence, came up with very elaborate schemes of how to check, I mean, um, whether the patient is really glycemic or not and so forth. And then all the debate about the C-peptide came up. Um, the the 50,000 paper transplant that we have in the registry, even if a patient is only on five units a day, it's, it, it is considered a failure. I mean, that's how stringent we are about, about it. Um, that I, I, I personally must say that I think the BMI and the C-peptide debate was um, ill um, conceived right from the get-go. Because if you have a patient on dialysis with a BMI of 33 who is a relatively brittle diabetic, I mean, you will not bring his um, BMI down to 28, where, he, where it should have been before. Now it's 30, and hopefully it will go up higher. But I think uh, sometimes with organizations like, uh, like UNOS, uh, common sense uh, doesn't always prevail. And then policies are put in place that are questioned thereafter and then corrected. Like in this case, I mean, there are many other, many other um, policies, but because there, I mean, in the end, it's done in small um, committees and so forth, and then it goes out for public comment. Some of these things, I mean, just uh, slip through the grids, and then we deal with it, and we have to correct it later. You know, I mean, from my perspective, uh, but we, but for like 30 years, C peptide was never an issue for pain restriction. It was always the patient insulin or not. So I, I think we are finally getting back to, I mean, where where we were and where, where we need to be. But do you agree that the BMI should be less than 35? Uh, yeah, by and large, yeah. Yeah. but again, it depends again. I mean, let's say you have a very athletic young guy who is on dialysis, his BMI is 36, yes, you will tell him, I mean, that he has to lose weight. But would you compare that to the average of the population? I'm, I'm not sure about that. You know, what you could mm -hmm. do then is just give him a kidney first. First, and then. And, and see how he does, if he is able to uh, lose weight or if he has a um, uh, weight-reducing procedures and evaluate it. Right. Um, so as you see, some of this pancreas policies are going to be constant discussions as we develop. Uh, Dr. Grisner, that raises a very interesting question, particularly with the uh, high BMI, Bill's grade 130, mm -hmm. because they, you know, the evidence from you know, bariatric procedures and, and, and its own research is that just that procedure alone reduces the insulin requirement or insulin for some of these patients. Should we not consider that particularly for those with larger in this population? Yes, yes, I, I, I think as, as Dr. Sari just said, I think in these patients um, that are a little bit outside of the usual criteria, we all have to get together and come to a consensus. Because I, I think I've been mean, pushing too hard uh, in one direction or another. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's not good. I think we as a uh, as a transplant center have to have a team approach where basically most of us, I mean, agree with what we are doing. And of course, if, if there, are, there are reasons why it should not be done, and a very objective reason, I mean, we want to do it. Yeah. Um, but but as, as you mentioned before, uh, you know, um, I, I sometimes think all these, these many policies that we have in place, if, if, we, if you just take all comers and then you work your way through, yes, I mean, it does take a lot of, of work. But that way you give everyone a chance at least, I mean, to be presented and, and, and to see what's going on. There are many patients out there that are denied by one center after another, and then eventually, I mean, someone takes them on. And, and I, I, I have always been of the opinion it's better to be inclusive than exclusive. I mean, you still can make the point, no, this is not a good candidate. Um, but we should be the center then where people say, oh, Downstate didn't, even Downstate didn't take that patient. You know, that we, set, that we set the standard, you know? I mean, people know they can come to us, 
we evaluate them, but when we say no, I mean, it's for very, very good reason. Um, because otherwise, we are just following what, I mean, the others are doing. I'm sure, I mean, we will see a few patients that may not be, be uh, transferred at Columbia or at, um, at Cornell or whatever. And, and what Dr. Saki was uh, saying, I mean, actually makes me really proud if, if patients go to Columbia where they have the nice clinics and the nice whatever building and so forth. And they still like us better because the people here seem to be more concerned about them and more engaged. I mean, then we have done our job. Because in the end, that's what it is. I mean, the, the brick and mortars are not going to do the transplant. It, it, it's us. And, 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 and that's what is so important and, and, and what counts. You know, we, we have these without <coughs> we advertise any about patient transplantation, we have patients that already have contact with us because they want to see us and they want to transplant us. And this is all good. Look, diabetes is, is considered a disease of um, poor, underprivileged people, and it's considered a disease that is by and large not well reimbursed. That's one of the reasons why all the medicine centers have huge liver transplant centers. But no one is doing, I mean, pancreas transplant. Dr. John was mentioning what was 25 or whatever the number is. When I was in Minnesota for one year, we, we did every seventh pancreas transplant in the world. We did 150 pancreas transplants in 160 in one year. That, that's as much as it takes in six years for all the New York centers to do pancreas transplants. So we have a huge, huge opportunity to do it here. And patients will be coming to us, not only for pancreas transplants, but also for kidney transplants. So once it is established, I think it will have a huge effect on who is going to come to us and, and, and who wants to be transplanted here. I'm going to add a little history to what you're saying. One of the issues in the New York area, there were, there were, a couple, there were, there were like about three, endocr three or four endocrinologists, mm -hmm. particularly in the Manhattan area, who have a lot of type 1 diabetics on their, their care. Uh, one of them was at NYU. He refused to have any kidney pancreas transplants done for any of his patients in the New York area, except for the two of them. That's correct. That's um, correct. No, no, he's yeah. the only patients to uh, right. Arizona. <laughs> exactly. He never wanted anyone in New York to do it. And he had a huge population of type 1 diabetes. And but then what he always told us was that the results were not good enough and that these centers were not willing to, uh, to take care of uh, these patients like Wisconsin or Minnesota. The answer is wrong. Because we but were... But that's a perception. No, that's his perception, because I met with him on a number of occasions and took care of the, the, the pancreas patients that we did very well, and some of them are surviving after 15, 16 years, a good number of them. Uh, one of them is at 17 years now, and he's doing very well. And the thing about it, it's his perception, the perception that he started before we got there, never gave anyone a chance to send them elsewhere. I don't think he wanted to, in, to talk, have to talk to a surgeon mm. directly. Mm. And that's part of the process, what I meant when I met with him. He, he barely wanted to talk to him. And that's you it. know, he called us up for every single patient we called in, for every patient that we transferred. Well, we'll see. I mean, I'll give him a call once we have the pancreas program. He's at the VA and Maybe, maybe. Maybe you might change. You <laughs> may <laughs> think <laughs> you may think Brooklyn is Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to make two points about, one point about BMI is, of course, the BMI can be high, but if the insulin requirements in that individual is also very high, the chances of them getting off insulin after pancreas transplant is not that great. There was a D's paper, which I, I can show later on, and he did an analysis. So you have to take the history of amount of insulin. So if they require about 70 units a day, and the BMI is high, and they get a pancreas transplant, they might not get off insulin. Uh, I'm going to skip everything. I'm going to show what actually for uh, maintenance, for uh, complications, just a few words. Okay, so Dr. Grusin already mentioned, I'll show you some pictures I saw there. This is the forcep is pointing towards a duodenal, uh, duodenum doesn't look good. This is a, like he mentioned, if the pancreas is coming with a blob of fat and you're sitting and <laughs> dissecting the fat for hours and hours, and by the way, this took us three hours to dissect until we reached the point of duodenum, and, and the duodenum had a slightly blackish, I don't know whether you can see it, area. And we were not sure if the duodenum is almost ready for perforation. Sorry. Um, and this organ, after spending time, was rejected because the duodenal loop 
was, <laughs> was not safe to, um, in the eyes of the surgeons. Um, and, and we debated whether there was an NG tube in the patient who, had, you know, who died or was it an ulcer that was going to bleed. We didn't cut this open, but the organ was sent away for research. And if you can see, I can't point, but that's the spleen that Dr. Grusner was talking about at the end. This, this is the spleen that is attached. And so it takes a lot of work to dissect away the tissue and, and the spleen. Um, and if, this is so only after you know that yes, I can do the reconstruction or that, that takes hours, but I mean, this takes about half an hour or so just to get an idea whether it's transplantable or not because you obviously cannot open the patient and then say, hey, hold a second, I mean, the pancreas now is not good, we are not doing the transplant. So I mean, you have to start with the bench work first and make sure everything looks okay. And once that is okay, then the patient comes to the room and then you uh, uh, open the patient. But uh, this is different than with. Uh, So here is another pancreas that looked quite nice actually after dissection, but I don't know whether you can make out, which was actually Dr. Grusner mentioned it in a, in a rush. There is a capsular tear here. The capsule is not intact. While, while procure meant something had happened. Now, this could cause, once it goes in the belly, pancreas juices leaking into the peritoneum and causing peritonitis. So Dr. Kaufman actually rejected this organ. Um, now this looks like a very good pancreas after dissection and ready to go in. Uh, spleen is gone, and I did not show the iliac vessels which were taken from the donor and the y anastomosis was done, which Dr. Guzman already showed, but it's, it's really a very delicate work that they do to anastomose and make sure it's, it's all patent. Um, so, this, this slide is important for people who will take care of pancreas patients post-transplant on the floors. Um, and, you know, whenever there's an increased amylase or lipase, we think of, of this, this, this chart in this way early, meaning there could be from ileus, uh, post-surgical complications, parenchymal leak, enteric leak, etc. Late is rejections. Um, of course, uh, you know, thrombosis can happen, as was mentioned. Um, tacrotoxicity, sepsis, all of these are possibilities. So one case, I just, one or two cases, 45-year-old male, 11 days post PTA, came to the emergency department. By the way, the length of stay at Wisconsin is four and a half to five days. They don't go to ICU, but here we will be sending them to the ICU because of our infrastructure is not actually totally ready, right, for, for floor observation, but we'll hopefully get there. Um, anyway, this gentleman came with hy uh, hypoglycemic unawareness, I guess. Um, anyway, he was on thymo attack, MMF, he, uh, readmitted with fever, and, what, and his enzymes were elevated, amylase and lipase. Glucose is normal, TAC level was 12. What should the workup be? Such a patient, you know, of course we will learn as more of us take care of it, is, is uh, elevated enzymes in a pancreas transplant patient can mean a lot of things, uh, from enteric leak to an abscess, peritonitis, et cetera. Um, and of course, it's rejection is always in the picture, so what do we do? So we, all, we will be asking, and we had a meeting with the radiologist, we need a CAT scan. Um, immediately from the emergency room to look at the organs if there's leak or perforation. Um, anything that is possible perforation, of course, go to the OR immediately. And if everything looks sort of stable, but just the enzymes are going up, then you have to suspect that there's rejection going on, and the patient will move towards a pancreas biopsy. Um, again, this is available for you all. I'm not gonna go over it, but what I saw was an elevation enzymes being caused by a lot of ileus post-operatively, um, as was mentioned, because there's a backflow of the duodenal juices um, into the pancreas. So we have to keep the bowels rested for a little bit until the bowels start to move, no obstruction. 
Of course, they are going pain medicines. That becomes an issue. Now they can't move. They get obstructed. So you all will see all of this eventually. This is a, a, another one that came in with pancreatic enzymes, acute abdomen, and there was a perforated closed loop obstruction. The arrows point towards it. This, such a patient would go to the operating room immediately. Uh, this patient formed a large cyst, a pseudocyst. Uh, and there is, a, there is a flow sheet chart here saying that if you, if you see a, a CAT scan with some fluid collection, the first thing is to aspirate it. Um, the three things f for teaching purposes are that if you, s you have to decide, does it have high bilirubin or does it have amylase and, and culture it? And based on that, if it has high bilirubin and amylase, the leak is at the duodenal segment, patient goes to the operating room. If you don't have bilirubin but just high amylase without any infection, then you can treat with octerotide uh, and with drainage. So, you know, we can uh, stratify patients managed medically and through the help of IR versus some that need to go to the OR. And some may need antibiotics and maybe an abscess. So we really need the help of IR people postoperatively. I'm going to skip all of this. And I'm just going to say that I have been, I've tried to get ultrasound-guided pancreas biopsy. Hopefully it'll happen. If not, we'll have to use CT-guided for now. I think I can... We, 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 we got to be realistic here. Can, I know. And, can I turn the lights on? No, really, in terms of where the expertise lie in terms of interventional work. And the situation like this, the interventionalist here was much more comfortable using the CD, CT guided biopsies. Mm -hmm. And in time, with the use of ultrasound, they do use ultrasound for certain things. But something like this, they will clearly do a CT guided biopsy to be more accurate. Right, so I did almost five there. And uh, it, was, it was literally, <laughs> I mean, I thought kidney biopsies, you know, and there have been some. None of them had, it was so easy to do. Because it, it relied solely on the skill with the, your technician that's helping, and so that's something we'll have to see if we can, they can get trained. And, and, and the correct apparatus, it's, it, you get it in first shot. Correct. So, so I think for now, we'll go with No, no, I, I understand, I understand, I understand. But this is something that, you know, because we want to keep everything within our transplant right. division, so. Yes, yes, at the same time. Yes, we, we will be, yes, absolutely. Thank you for reminding me. Now, we are in discussions about having a pathologist trained to read biopsies. Do you want to make some comments, Dr. Bruce, no, about Dr. Drakenberg? Well, Toby Sinder, do a unit of Maryland, uh, uh, Dr. Drakenberg is the one that uh, developed the uh, uh, band criteria for <coughs> Right, so this was a case that came in with pancreatic enzymes elevated, CT was negative, there was no fluid collection, biopsy was done, and this shows quite significant arteritis happening, and patient received thymo and steroid pulse, um, then the antibody results came back, she was having both cell-mediated and antibody, and just like we do in kidney, we did plasma phresis, IVIG, and her, her lipase came. By the way, this question came up, is amylase more important than lipase? Lipase is actually more sensitive. And, and in, in, in other parts of pancreatitis management, we rely on amylase more than lipase. Specific. Specific, yeah, so. All right, I think I'll, st I'll, I'll I'm coming to an end uh, here. But um, you could develop cancer in the pancreas too over time. So the, this was a, d a paper that a fellow wrote about cystic lesions and management. It's available for you all. And we can have diabetes develop also as the pancreas is rejecting. And the workup is a little bit different. I don't have too much time to go over it. But this was the paper I was talking about where type 1 and type 2 diabetics, if you have more than 75 in units of insulin per day and you have a little bit high BMI, they probably will not get off insulin. And similarly with type 1 diabetics also. So 75 units is a cutoff about. That they, they, you can't promise them that they'll be off insulin. Um, I think, and this was a case that a uh, patient appeared much later, and when they cut him open, the duo, uh, you know, everything looks like a mess here, but the, but the duodenum was, was leaking. 
And this was a picture to show us that. Um, OK, I think I'll end there. The, the rest are biopsy pictures. And any questions anybody might have? I, I ran through it, and I, if I took too much time, I apologize. But. Uh,